everybody. He wanted me to say hi first. I asked her if she wanted to. Hi. Hi. It's Friday. Again. Yep. Here we are. There's crap everywhere. Yep. It's the way things go. So how are things in your world, in your neighborhood? Hopefully they're good. What? Oh no, the dog wants in. So anyway, it's been another long, crazy week. Sabrina started doing bench presses. Yes, I did. I had to spot her. <laughs> what, dude? Everything's fine. Oh. oh there's okay, a... so, since he's here, I got the wisdom panel test done, DNA test done. We think it's a load of crap. We, we, they screwed it up. And... Or it could have been human error, which is possible because I touched the, the swab because I'm not too bright. But anyway, the first thing they said I could kind of buy, which is an American Staffordshire, whatever, Terrier. Okay, that's fine. And then it said, chow chow. And only those two things. We know for On a, both sides. On both sides. And we know for a fact he's dachshund, because his mommy was dachshund, and he has webbed feet. Which, dachshunds are the only ones that have this coloration and webbed feet. So, of all, it, all, like, the ten breeds worldwide that have webbed feet. Right, so it said that, d does this look like a chow chow? No. 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 <laughs> so I got, because I'm wasting my money on said things, we I got the Embark... DNA test that we just did and going to send it in tomorrow because he is not part Chow Chow. Sadie joked that because I touched it, that means I'm part Chow Chow. True. <laughs> so we just did the new test, but then she discovered it. She was looking at the swab and it had little blue flakes on it. Then I realized that he'd been chewing on a play block, a wooden one. And so they're probably going to tell us that he's deciduous. <laughs> okay. Let's see. Questions. This one is... Oh, don't look at the watch I'm wearing. Why don't we play what watch is she wearing now first? Okay, well, I wasn't looking at your watch. I have no well, idea. Well, it's too big, so it's falling off me. It's annoying. It's a, it's a 7A watch. It's um, it's a it's a quartz chronograph, a Seiko quartz chronograph. Oh, no, I'm completely <laughs> wrong. The buttons failed me. I, I mean, if you want to wear this, we can adjust that. I just wanted to fix something I thought you'd get wrong. Uh -huh. Oh, man. Um, I'm not wearing my glasses. This is an... This you are. I, well, I'm not, these are the wrong glasses. <laughs> anyway, she was wearing my super cool... What is this thing? Is this an oh. A124? Does it say it on the back? Because oh, it's an alarm chronograph. Yes, of course it does. It I says a model on the back. I can't... I. It's a 5019A. I know that. 5019G. Uh, a159. A 5019G. I knew the second part. A159. Anyway, super cool. These were. This is. This is big deal back when this came out. These were expensive, and it's very rare to see them look like this. I don't know. You flummoxed me. It was the four buttons. I'm like, all it could be is a 7A. <laughs> That's a cool watch. That's a neat watch. It really is. Well, it's too big, and it was flopping around on me. So. Hmm. Anyway. Okay. This is a six-part question. Wow. So I'll do one part at a time. From RG. Hi, Sabrina and Spencer. As usual, interesting and fun discussions. What, is it not working? Uh, no, I'm just going to turn Do I need to scream? So no, I think you're... So people don't say they can't hear me? No, I think it's fine. All okay. right. As usual, interesting and fun. Oh, great. The heater is on. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not going upstairs because I'll alert Sebastian if I go and turn off the heater. And... So sorry about the background noise. The heater just kicked in. <laughs> it's cold. Anyway, I am back with a bunch of new questions. One, is it possible in an all-original 6105 that the loom on the hands is more faded than on the hour marks? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Pardon me. Uh, the reason for that being Seiko loom, as I always say, all Seiko loom, vintage loom, is salt-based. So you have, here's the 6105, 8119. It's completely all original and all the lube matches, dial and everything else like that. What happens is that the, the moisture gets in because the watch is not maintained. And so moisture gets in. And then when it's on the wrist, the watch heats up inside and the moisture runs around. And the, the crystal is comparatively cooler. So you get condensation on the inside of the crystal. And then the salt in the lube attracts the moisture. And when that happens, you start to get corrosion where the, the loom will, with the water, start to pull metal out of the, um, 
out of the hands. And so you'll see the tip of the sweep hand goes bad first, and then the inside of the, the inside parts of the loom windows themselves in the hour and the minute hands, and sort of the grossness sort of seeps out. And then if there's enough water inside, then it'll get the dial. And it, this is true for all vintage Seikos. Anything that has, it, it's just, it's the way that goes. It's simple physics. It's the way that it, way that it happens. Number two. Where can I get an NOS 6105 hands, nothing on eBay? You can find the sweep hands, the, the second hands, um, sometimes. Uh, well, you used to be able to get them for a little bit. There's this guy, um, uh, Stefan Redimski, he's in England, and he has a contact with somebody who's clearing out the old Seiko parts warehouse, Seiko service center in England or something, and he has been selling amazingly rare stuff. Um, and he had some 6105 sweeps for a while, but I think they're all dried up. Uh, no, new old stock, right, forget it. You're not going to be able to find it. There are much better handsets on eBay now. Um, the metal on the hour and the minute hands is basically perfect. Um, the sweep hands are a little... The, the, I, I have another video where I talk about the sweep hands. They're, they're getting better, but... Um, but they're 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 better than anything they had before. They're almost to the point of being acceptable. And since Seiko doesn't make replacement parts, what are you gonna do? Number three, I have an unrestored but clean sixty two MAS in the mail soon. Which parts almost always need to be replaced in these but are the hardest to find? Which parts are interchangeable with other common sixty two uh, typically, you're going to see the same stuff that we always see. Uh, the problem with the 62 ones is that, like, the setting lever assembly is kind of weak and the winding pinions are kind of weak, and so what will happen is you'll pull out the crown to set the time, and as you're setting the time and moving the hands, you'll feel the, the winding pinion going click, 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 because it's skipping a tooth. Um, so winding pinions uh, are, are, are also called a, the, the, the clutch wheel is another term for it. Um, and so you, those are there. Uh, the setting levers, um, you know, if you can get balances, man, they're they're a good thing to get a hold of. The same thing with pallet forks and escape wheels and third wheels and fourth wheels and all the wheels. Um, and but the biggest thing is going to be they're going to be wear in the lower mainspring arbor port, um, and that's not really there's no replacement for that. You just have to fix it. But what you can do with those is you can actually find, and I think Stefan Radimski again, and he's he sells it on eBay under Slachi 61. What you can do with those is he was selling um, 6218 train bridges. And the thing about the 6218 train bridges, they're fully jeweled, including the mainspring armor. So that's that's actually a kind of a cool thing to pick up. Uh, for the most part, uh, yes, they are interchangeable. The big difference is the main plate, which is like the foundation that the watch movement is built on. Because the thing with the 6105 is that the date setting is pull and turn to set versus a 6106 or 6119 or whatever. And those are push quick sets. And so one won't work with the other because this is a fixed uh, crown setup. And so you can't push it in it's not decided it's not designed to do that but all the other stuff for the most part like all the wheels and the, the train bridge and the balance and all that stuff it's that's all the same winding pinion the whole assembly the difference is the 6105 uses um a setting lever assembly like the 6138 which is it's this composite piece um that has like it's like this composite built piece that that has like the 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 data correcting stuff in there, built in, and the 6105, 6106, 6119 doesn't have that because it has a quick set reset. What? <laughs> I'm not listening, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Why would you want to listen? I don't know, and I'm trying to not have a funny face, so I was looking at my iPad. What are you going to do when I get hit by a blimp? You're going to look at this stuff and say, gosh, I wish I knew how to deal with this. But thing. it's on a video. I suppose that's true. Ha! Okay. Any idea which aftermarket bracelet may fit a 6139 Uh That's tough because, actually, I should, here, hold this. Uh, that's tough because they're a weird uh, case. Um, yeah, 
shots this year. <laughs> Did you just drop it? No, I dropped my iPad. What's that? I dropped my iPad. Oh, you did? Okay. Uh, so, this is this is a similar model. I should have this memorized, but naturally I don't. This is a 6139-7002, uh, unrestored. There it is. It's the same kind of case as the watch you're talking about. The end links on these are really weird. Um, they're sort of shallow and short and curved on the top. I'm not aware of any aftermarkets that'll just drop in. It's just one of those funky things that Seiko does. Um, in fact, I don't even think this is the right set of end links for this watch. These don't look like they're fitted correctly at all. This is one of the watches out of my parts, my, my project store, so I haven't looked too closely at this, but they're just, they're sort of a weird, honestly, I've owned a lot of examples of this case type. I don't think I've ever had one on the original bracelet that I've worn. They're just hard to find. Uh... What are your favorite TV shows right now or ever? Both of you answer, please. You watch a lot more TV than yeah, me. Yeah, he's not big on TV. Um, he listens from the other room when I'm watching. But we both like Star Trek. Um, I grew up on Star Trek. And... And the original Battlestar Galactica. And I don't know. Well, you weren't alive. But I've seen TOS. I know. I wasn't alive. No, that's true. But nobody, re they've never replayed the original Battlestar Galactica. And I can't imagine anybody would want to watch it. It must be terrible. Uh, <laughs> um, I really like TNG and DS9. Um, I love X-Files. And I thought the last season was, was pretty okay. Um, we, we, I'm sorry. I was going to say, I'm sorry they're not making anymore, but whatever. We watched, uh, we loved Breaking Bad. We watched all of that stuff. Um, I like... I like Buffy. Ooh, she's a big Buffy fan. And I like the Angel. I thought that was good after the first two seasons. Um, I just watched the Ted Bundy documentary, because I did. Um, uh, I watched Handsmaid's Tale, but I didn't watch season two, because it seemed kind of... I read the book, so I knew what was going to happen in season one. I don't... I don't and, I don't know. <laughs> the, the only TV show I can think of re that I watched that was on my own, uh, God, it was a long time ago, it was Band of Brothers. Uh, but one of the reasons I loved it so much, because I'm was not so much anymore, but I was a gigantic, like, nut for World War II stuff. I've been to a lot of the locations that they went to. Like, I've physically been there. And there are certain aspects, certain things that they got right that just amazed me. Like, there's, at the very, very end, they're at this place called the, the Kelstein House. Some people call it the Eagle's Nest. But you're, you're up there near the Bavarian Alps, and the air has this sort of, the light has this sort of, sort of milky quality, it's hard to explain, sort of this golden look to it, this certain sort of flatness. And they had it in the show, even though even though that whole, all of those scenes were filmed in a studio, they weren't at the original Kelshney house, because if you go to the original, the real one, like all of, like the mantelpiece and everything is just fully carved with uh, um, all of the, the initials and names of all the United um, Allied soldiers that took that place over, it's all carved up, but in that show it was immaculate that had not happened yet but they got that light right and they got so many things right and i guess they had they flew in a lot of veterans and had them sort of check everything before anything happened i did love band of brothers someday i'm going to get her to watch it but she doesn't like that kind of stuff oh, and you but it's great stories and plus ross from friends is in it i don't like friends she loves friends no but i've seen every episode even though i hate it um, you watched Trailer Park Boys without me. Oh, I did like Trailer Park Boys. I thought that was just sort of... It took me a second to get into it, but I'm like, I don't know. I just thought it was really uh, funny. We liked The Sopranos. I've oh, watched that like a million times. Um, but I don't know. Recently, I, I've been playing video games and he watches me. I played Witcher 3 twice and now I'm playing Red Dead Redemption I, She too. plays video games and we have a big TV and I sit there and I fiddle with my stuff and I look at the thing and I last night I, I wrapped the sheath here and some old stuff and that's yeah. what I did. So that's what we've been up to. <laughs> okay, next question. Oh, South Park. Oh yeah, duh. South Park is just such a part of everything that I don't even I mean we live it. in Colorado. Yeah. And and actually it's so funny because obviously I've been watching it since I was a kid when it came out because I was I was in sixth grade <laughs> when it came out. <laughs> and there were so many jokes that I didn't get. And then I moved here and I'm like 
I get the joke. Like, when, when the first time I saw the, the Casa Bonita episode, I was like, that's such a hilarious idea for a restaurant. He was like, that is a restaurant. It is a restaurant. It <laughs> exists. And, and a lot of people are like, wait a minute, Casa Bonita's real? Oh, yeah, it's yeah, real. We've and been it's there. T- all oh, the food's awful. <laughs> oh, it's awful. It's so bad. And you sort of, you have to go in and you're sort of shuttled through these lines and you have to prepay for your food because they don't, they wouldn't dare try to present you with a bill after you tried to eat it. Ugh. It, it is awful. It's awful. It's like a bad acid trip filled with screaming children. <laughs> I wouldn't know. Um, and what else was there in it? That, oh, the Greeley episode with all the cows. She, she <laughs> never understood why everybody here makes fun of Greeley. And then the wind came, and it could just smell. Yeah, the wind cows. kicks in from the right way. You can smell Greeley. You can smell the stockyards. It's yes. what they what they joke and they say. Well, that's the smell of money. Yeah, but Greeley's <laughs> Greeley's a, a a wretched hellhole, crawling with post apocalyptic <laughs> nightmares. That's how you know someone's in Fort Collins as they say that about Greeley. I was amazed. The last time we went to Greeley, they have electricity. <gasps> I'm astonished. I have no idea that they actually, they understood electricity. I didn't think they understood fire. They have a, a university. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, go on. Uh, oh, God, my iPad turned off. Hang on. Okay. From Lucky Gold Panda. Hey, for next, today's mail call... I would like to know anything and everything you may know about Seiko's Caliber 2220. I recently picked up a Seiko 2220-3031 and would love to know more about the piece. Well, the Seiko 22, that series, it's a ladies' watch movement, um, but they are, uh, they're actually, they're super high-end. They're tiny, tiny movements, but... Just, I did some checking before this. I actually looked at these questions to do some research. And they are, they've got like triple, they've got like, like you open up the back and you're looking at four, four dia shock settings. Four of them. Not just one in the balance that you can see, but three others over the train. Uh, the mainspring arbor jewel is, is, is in place. It's jeweled. Uh, it, it's got a fine adjust on the balance. Uh, they look like they're really nice, nice pieces. And Looking at the different models that use those for men, they tended to be quite small, 27, 28, 30 millimeters, but like little tank watches and stuff like this. And I'm sure that in good service condition, those movements would be aces uh, because, I mean, they've got they've got all those dia shock settings that are great for keeping the, the lubrication clean and in place and fine adjust stuff. And I bet they'd just be ass kickers. Okay, about the sword from Bernardo Pena. And the wood could very well be bay leaf or laurel. It's pretty coming for... Da, da, da. It's pretty coming for the Gualala area. I used to work in that area. It's pretty country out there. It is. It is. Yeah, and actually this wood, I was just going to... I was going to do like a like a wrap, like wrap the handle. But after I started working on the wood, it was just this piece of... Uh, it was just this piece of driftwood, and I thought it was pretty. But then when I started opening it up and I saw the variation in the color of it and the stripes, I was like, that's really cool. And Sabrina said, well, you should probably keep it the way that it is. So this is a chunk of the wood, and it was this big sort of curve thing like this. And so this is what it looked like, this twisty stuff. And then I did an experiment where I, I had one piece of it here, and then I, I polished one side, and I saw the sort of all the colors of the wood and it's light and it's very aromatic but it has this it's really stiff and it has this sort of brightness like this handle before I finished it you'd run your fingers over it and it had this like I don't know almost sort of like a chimey sound to it like it was bright it didn't sound dull like wood it was something else I don't know it's interesting stuff I don't know what it was but it, it, it had another one of those happy accidents um from UK Firebird. Great video as always, guys. I wonder if the prices of the 6105s will fall like the 6309s did with no, that didn't. 
was reissued and the turtle went into production. I hope not, but if the reissue 6105 goes into full production for a couple of years, then they probably will. Every single reissue that I have seen has driven up the prices of the originals significantly. Before the 6309 was reissued with the SRP line, before they were reissued, you could get a good a good 61, a 6309 diver. You could get them for about, I don't know, two or three hundred dollars. Uh, for really nice ones now, they're they're easily trending in the high in the high three figures, and if they're if they're good enough or special enough or new old stock enough, they will they'll sell without question in the high threes and maybe even the low fours, depending. Uh, they went up like crazy when I bought my when I bought when we bought the sixty one fifty nine seven thousand one, which that was a big big purchase. That was twenty six hundred dollars we had to spend on that. that was a lot of money. Um, and then the reissues came out. Uh, the new reissues and they skyrocketed in price. They, it's I had I I had some guy offer me fifteen thousand dollars for mine. I, I'm not quite sure why, but he did. When the sixty two MAS reissues came out uh, that summer, that but that they came out in the in like November, I think. I had that previous June. I had sold a sixty two MAS that I had restored. I sold it for twelve hundred dollars, one thousand two hundred dollars, and by the time those the reissues had come out. Prices on the 62 MASs had shot in, into the like into the two, 2500 range, and I sold my last 62 MAS, which was a very good one, oh uh, gosh, for thirty eight hundred dollars, and it's probably worth more now. All right, I don't remember. So in every case that I have seen, values have gone up. Original 6105s, like something in this condition, they're they're in the high fours now, like eighteen hundred, two thousand, twenty two hundred dollars. They're getting. They're getting up there because in this condition, they're getting harder and harder to find. Now there are a ton of them on eBay, and you can still find them, but they're gonna these things are gonna jump up in price because you're gonna have a lot of people buying the reissues, and they're gonna say, "Well, it'd be also nice to have one of the originals," and they're gonna start fighting for examples. From J Co. Spencer, with all of the new release of watches celebrating earlier generations from Seiko, Bulova, etc., what impact does it have on the original models? You sort of just said. I sort of that. just said that, but I think it's the same kind of thing. Like you see, like Oris reissuing their stuff, or even like God help us all, Squail stuff like this. Is the the people all of a sudden are aware of the model? They're aware of the company, the brand name, and then they're aware that there's an original back in the day, and then they start looking for it. It's like anything else. If you have demand, price will rise. And so you're kind of getting the word out there, and prices rise. From Mark Wilco, Spencer, I was wondering if you still use the lubricants listed in the old Seiko repair manuals, or do you have a crossover list of new or better lubricants to use instead? Um, I That was a really big question, one that I sort of struggled with a whole lot. Um, I eventually had to really sort of lean into some like old, some more old horologists, like old school guys who really knew their stuff to sort of think about it. I couldn't really find that it was written down anywhere. I use a, a mix. Uh, this, the standard lubrication, the standard lubrication for like, for like fourth wheels and, and, you know, and uh, cap tools and stuff like that is, is these days I use Mobius 9010. Synthalube. It's very, very standard stuff. Synthetic. Uh, it doesn't. Um, it doesn't turn to shellac. It's. It's very solid. For. Um, for only for pallet forks, I use something very specific. It's Mobius nine four one five. It's a. It's a kind of a dual function lubrication. It acts as a grease. It just sticks where it's supposed to be. It doesn't move until it is physically touched and moved. In which case, it turns into an oil. So it, 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 it's almost like non-Newtonian, it's sort of in a way, not really. Um, there are other, I mean, and the, that too is synthetic. Like, I could use, like, this is, this is Mobius 8000. This is a natural lubricant, which is really old school. Um, and one can use it. The problem is, is that this is literally, as the, as the, the, the solvents and everything outgas and go away, you, this sort of polymerizes and it turns into shellac. And that's, that's kind of a problem. Um, so, I, I mean, like, I have this, but I don't really use it. The only Seiko lubricants that I actually use, and these are hell on wheels to find, and I got these new old stock, uh, and they're still good, Seiko S2 and S4, and they're specified. This is Seiko S2. This is the actually the super key one. This is the mainspring grease. 
And you know, it, we, uh, for those who have opened original Seiko barrels that have never been touched, you open them up and they've got this black stuff in them. That's what this is. It's this really heavy duty black grease and it's, it's the stuff. The S4 is sort of a, is a thinner, more, less viscous, less chunky sort of stuff like this. And it's specified for things like um, keyless works and stuff like that. I don't really use it that often. And funnily, it doesn't appear that Seiko did either. Because whenever I open up an unrestored original Seiko movement, I don't see this, this black grease on any of the keyless works. I don't see that. Um, the other one's black too. Yeah, they're both black. Yeah, but it's much, it's much thicker. Wait, so is that when you're like, ew, look at this, it's so chunky? Does well, it get chunkier over time. Well, no. What it does is it gets really dry, and it it, it gets dry and it gets filled with like metallic stuff. So it has this like gl almost like glitter look to it. But it's just, it's like it's not, it doesn't do anything. It just it's like it's like old dried caulk. It's what it looks like when you pull it out because this is completely different. This is actually. This is this is a lubricant. That other stuff is just dried out garbage. But that's what it is. Dried out garbage. Dried out garbage. Okay. So yes, I use a mixture of what's going on. Okay, this is a comment on the blue Pogue video of a million of them from Paul W W. Golly gosh, I want one of these one day. Dad said he had one, but thinks he threw it out. Hi from Australia. I cannot even imagine, and I seriously think about this sometimes. I started thinking about this a, a couple, three years ago. There was a kid who wrote me on Reddit, and he's like, hey, I really am looking for a 6105 diver. And I'm like, okay. And he's like, well, I'm 17. And I'm like, even then, they were expensive. And he's like, well, here's the thing. My dad had one brand new, and I have, he was wearing it when he was inducted into the Navy in the 1970s. And he showed me the picture, and there's his, his, his dad with big old head of hair, with his hand in the air taking the oath and on the other wrist you can see 6105 his he had it with the box and everything else like this and his mother was cleaning his room and she found it she's like oh old watch she just threw it away and i cannot i can't imagine how many old watches are in landfills it, i i try not to think about it it makes me crazy it makes me want to go get a shovel no seriously can you imagine if you had the right kind of rig to basically sort of strip mine, strip mine, like big old landfills, the stuff that you could find. Oh, it'd be amazing. Ew. Oh, but I mean, amazing stuff. Yeah, but ew. No, there was a guy, when I was in high school, there was an old man in town who had been um, a U-boat commander during World War II. A lot of German veterans lived in this town after the war because there was a giant German POW camp uh, across what is now I-25. And so they were employed there for beet farming. And so after the war, I guess they liked it, a lot of them came back. But anyway, a friend of mine in high school, Mike Lindstrom, this old U-boat commander, gave my buddy, not Mike Lindstrom, Mike uh, Foster, and he gave, uh, he gave, Mike showed up one day at school and he had this guy's, all of his U-boat stuff. And Mike's mom threw it all away. It's in the landfill, it's up in the hill right now. Well then you go dig through, oh, 30 plus years of, 35? I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, anyway. <laughs> Uh, I'd like, like, there you go. From Daniel Munoz, I recently purchased a 6139 and wondered if it's normal to feel heat blinding rotor movement. New to vintage watches, thank you. Yeah, they're loud and kind of rumbly. Uh, Swiss watches, they tend to be, they tend to be a lot smoother uh, because the, the, the winding weight tends to be on a single fixed shaft and they spin on jewels or bearings and it's a much smoother action. Seiko uses ball bearings at this big weight and they kind of grumble and grumble and scrumble and grumble and you can really feel the weight rolling around. Like right now doing this, I can feel the weight moving and I, I can, can hear, hear it. it. You can, yeah, so, and you can hear the, you can hear the spring going ding, 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 ding. Yeah, it's very normal. From Walter Alvarado. Spencer, I know you are busy, but why not restore them and sell them? Your Midas touch and cult, like following among the Seiko collectors would make these an easy sell. Just a recommendation. I have been telling him that for a long time. There's no time. A cult like following? Do I actually have a cult like following? I can't imagine. Well, I only... didn't say that part. I said to go in his junk drawer and build watches and sell them. Yeah, but the problem is, is yes, I have a ton of watches, but there's no real time. I have, I still have, I have over a hundred jobs in line still. I'm trying to, I, I keep having to push back 
the date when I'm going to start accepting work again because I'm just not pumping through work fast enough. But, you know, honestly, when the time comes, if I get further enough down the line and I start taking jobs again, I'm not going to take every job. And I might turn my hand to doing more things of restoring stuff and selling it. But these are they're getting too expensive now to, to do that. But, I mean, the days of finding unrestored 6139s like this, it's getting hard. Yeah, because they're all here. I don't have a call. There's a huge segment of the watch, like, collecting world that probably looks down their noses at me. Oh, well, I don't. Well, I know. That's so sweet. <laughs> Sorry, it's just my standard client inferiority complex. You know what it is? It's, it's, uh, I do suffer from imposter syndrome, uh, which is always a, which is always an interesting thing. But yes, imposter syndrome. I don't, I don't believe in myself as much as I could. Well, I do, and that's why we well, are where that, we are. That's true. You do know how to open doors. See? I told you. Wow, when did he learn that? Today. Wow, he knows how to open doors. Yes, and here he is. Being cute. Okay, what's the next one? Okay, from Michael Valeris. Hi, Spencer and Sabrina. Enjoy your show, and it has become one more reason to look forward to Friday each week. Oh, thank you. <laughs> My question is in regards to the SRP777 turtle I purchased two years ago. During the first three months I wore it, it ran amazingly well at plus two to three seconds per day. Then it began losing time to the point where it is now minus 40 seconds per day. Also, there is an issue with the automatic wind feature as it does not seem to be winding the movement enough, even though I am very active and run two miles per day wearing the watch. When I wind it manually, it has a healthy 45 plus hour um, power reserve. I purchased the watch from a U.S.-based AD, so it has a three-year warranty. I contacted Seiko Repair in New Jersey, and besides being very rude, the woman quoted me a price of $325 for the repair, which is more than I paid for it. She couldn't quite understand that the watch was still under warranty and should be covered. It is still in like new condition without a scratch on it, and the actual wrist time during the two years I've had it is about six months. Is there something inherently wrong with the 4R36 movement as I had two second gen orange monsters with this movement that started losing time after a while, but they did not have the auto wind power reserve issue. Any insights, especially with the auto wind issue, would be appreciated as I really like the design of this watch and do not want to get rid of it as I did with the orange monsters. Thanks. Uh, well, you got a whole bunch of stuff there to talk about. Um, the first thing I would do would be to diagnose your watch. So you say it's losing like 40 seconds a day. Okay. Well, every morning get up and, and manually wind it like 30 times and then wear it and see if you're still experiencing that time loss. If you are, then it's probably what I've seen with a lot of these new movements, which is that Seiko's automatic lubricating is hit or miss. Uh, there have been so many issues and problems with the new, newer watches, and I've always thought of this as the C-type balance problem, but I don't believe it's really the balance. It's the fact that they changed the lubrication. I saw, I've seen brand new, brand new watches from Seiko with these kind of running problems, and I did a, a whole video on one of the 62 MAS reissues where I, I pulled it apart completely, and it, it was running terribly. Uh, and yeah, I was running terribly, and what I found was that it was over lubricated, under lubricated, not lubricated, and incorrectly lubricated. And so after I serviced that brand new movement, it ran like a dream. So that's probably part of it. Uh, to go back, if it turns out that your watch runs well when you hand wind it, but doesn't, but has problems when it's automatic winding, there's probably something wrong with the the winding weight Paul or something else like that. And if you're super active when you're wearing yours. There could be a wear thing that's happening with the automatic winding. It couldn't, the Paul lever could have failed and it could just not be putting the reduction gear, the reduction wheel around, and so it's just not winding. That would be the first thing that I would. Yes, that's the heavy. Um, uh, there were other issues of the quantity. What? I was just sorry. No, it's okay. There was just, there was a lot there. A woman, it's very rude, sick of New Jersey. I've spoken to the woman. She's incredibly rude. You have? Oh, yeah. I've spoken to her more than a few times. I'm like, I'm a, I'm a professional watchman. I specialize in sick. And she was like, and that means what to me. She could not have cared less. I, the thing is, there are, 
Seiko hates lots of things, but I swear they hate nothing more than their customers. God, they hate their customers. They despise them, especially at the New Jersey thing. God, they hate them. Um, uh, it, it's like, I don't know, people send them their watches for service. I'm surprised that they don't just do the Alice in Wonderland thing and fill them with butter and send them back. Um, I, I don't know. She's terribly, terribly rude. I've never had a good experience speaking with anybody at that location. I don't know what the core of their morale problem is, but, you know, back in the day in the 70s and Seiko's golden age, there were Seiko service centers. I think there were four in the United States alone. There was Chicago, there was, uh, there was Hawaii, there was uh, Los Angeles, and there was New York. Uh, and they were all over the world, all over the world. And Seiko just can't be bothered. They would just as soon take your watch, which is malfunctioning, and, ha and have you smash it with a hammer and then buy a new one. Yeah, well, that's how they make money. It's, but uh, Rolex doesn't work that way. Yeah, well, it's the whole throwaway culture thing. It's pathetic. But the tech is good. The design tech is good. This movement, this, this forearm movement that's in here, it's good tech. The designers did good work. The problem is QC from what I've been able to see, from what I've been able to see. This move, like this, even this watch, I've owned this since new, and it runs decently, but it's like it's not a super clean signal, and I've been meaning to actually service this thing. Um, because once these are serviced, they're, they're fine. They're great. It's a QC issue and then a customer support issue. So Seiko doesn't hate their customers, and Seiko does love watches, but it's just New Jersey. What are you going to do? Anyway. Um, well, that's it for questions. Okay. I wanted to say about the potential new video series. Hey, Daddy. You don't remember? I don't remember anything. Okay, so... The great thing about being married is you don't have to remember <laughs> anything. It's all remembered for you. So, on Tuesday, I had a uh, personal trainer session, which I have every, like, eight weeks. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi, Daniel. Hi, if you're watching this. Um, anyway, so, and he said that he likes to follow Spencer on Instagram, but... He doesn't understand, like, all the, the numbers of everything. Jargon. Jargon. And then, uh, then he looks at the comments to see if anybody can, you know, translate the jargon. And everybody's talking the way everybody talks. So we were thinking of maybe doing a beginner series. Because I'm sure there are people watching the video right now that are like, watches are cool, but I only sort of know what you're talking about. Right. And I start spouting off numbers or people are talking about numbers and all this stuff. And there's this whole, like... There's this whole like foundation of knowledge that a lot of new people coming to Seiko they simply don't have, and I, there are a lot of comments and emails I get. Hey, I'm new to watches. Hey, I love Seiko. Hey, I just started collecting, uh, and there's so much to know. And so we're she has a great idea. So I'm going to start basically like a, a beginner's introduction series on the core of what Seiko is and sort of to understand what their deals are. And so I don't know, sort of an educational. I can thing. think of something that's confusing that still confuses me. What serial numbers to figure out what year and month a watch comes out. So why don't you explain that for anybody that's potentially watching that knows nothing? I forget. I understand, but I forget. What, now? Right now. Just okay. The way Seiko serial numbers work, well, the way modern golden age Seiko serial numbers work is there's six digits. This I'm talking about from, and so of six digits. I am grabbing a watch. Okay, so let's look. This is a Seiko 6139-6002. And the serial number on this watch is 154814. The last four numbers really don't mean anything. That's the number of the watch that was produced in this year and month. The first two numbers are 1 and 5. So the first number is the, is the, last, is the last year of the decade in which this, was, this model was made. Seiko tends to make their stuff for 10 years or less generally. So we know that the 6139s were made from 1969 to about 1978, roughly. And so we can say, therefore, that one can only mean 1971. And then the next number, which is five, is May. So this was made in May of 1971. That's when this watch was from. And it's confusing because they are, you know, you've got to know, you got to know that the, you know, that the 66 you know, O2 movements, 66127, what those things, that they were only made from like 1963 to like 1967-ish. So you'd have to know that in order to understand and look at it and say that, oh, well, this thing has a case back date of 77, which means it was made in July of 1967. Um, it's just one of those things. It's confusing. Yeah, but what if you have a watch that was made throughout a 10-year period and then the two numbers are the same? Well, it's, that's really, that's, what do you mean, two numbers? The same? But, you have, 
Okay, so you have something. I don't know what, okay, I do, I, well, like the well, SK I, I do this, but I don't know anything, okay? So let's say you have a watch that came out in 1980, and it also came out in 1990. They were still producing that, and they both end in zeros. How do you... That's a real problem, and actually, uh, when it comes to, like, like the, a real good example of that is the, is the 007. The SKX 007, they were made, in fact, they're still being made as far as I know. They've been made now for almost two decades. And so you're going to have that exact scenario where it's like it's the, the, the first number is, is um, six. And is that 1996 when they started being made? Is that 2006 when they were still being made? Is it 2016? We don't know. The only way you'd probably really be able to tell is to take off the case back and look at what generation movement is inside, A, B, or C. And even that will give you a better idea, but that's it. Uh, yeah, it, so that makes it a lot tougher. It really does. But in vintage Seiko, what I specialize on, it's generally the rule is applicable. The 10 years or less on almost everything. Okay. That's really about it. Um, I'm also going to make another video. Some people have asked, and I really... I. I don't want to toot my own horn. That's what this is not about. But I, I, I enjoy I enjoy crafting and doing stuff. And a number of people have asked. And so I'm going to do a longer video about this sword. And I'm kind of annoyed I didn't do any in-process stuff. You have no idea how much work went into this. I handmade the whole thing. Well, except for the stabby pokey part. Well, yeah, but even that wasn't... that was, it was This was a factory second. It was completely unfinished. I know. So, and I had to work this complete, everything else I made, I made by hand from scratch. I don't have machine tools. I made all this stuff, all the, all the inlay, all that stuff I did myself. So we'll talk about it. And if people want to know more about it, we can talk about it. But other than that, man, it's the weekend. It's pizza day. We're going to make pizzas. We have special pizzas to make. We're making the Deadpool pizza. We are making the Deadpool pizza, which is um, uh, olives and pineapple. <laughs> okay, that's it. Thank you so much for watching, and uh, look for a sword video. And I'll I'll do the first stage of let's talk about Seiko. This ooh, that's a good name for the series. Let's talk about Seiko. let's talk about the Seiko. beginner's guide. Let's talk about Seiko, the beginner's guide. Watch for it this weekend. Okay, bye bye.